Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Hey, thank you, my beautiful people. Okay, so before I start, I am not in DevRel. Uh, I am not a professional speaker. I am an introvert, and I am an extreme introvert. I am in the most 1% extreme introverts, according to every profile test that I've ever taken. Uh, and I get a lot of the anxiety, social anxiety, when I get up here and do this. Uh, so be gentle with me, please. Uh, but what I have to talk about today is absolutely amazing. Uh, this is really big stuff in the database world. Uh, so I'm very excited to talk about it. Uh, and despite all of my faults, that's why I'm up here. A little bit about myself. Uh, I'm an engineer uh, originally, and I still am at heart. I've been a consultant for over 10 years. Uh, and now, I, this year, I was moved into a product. I'm still not too sure what product people do. I'm figuring that out as I go along. Um, I've also been involved in open source for more than a decade, close to two decades now. I'm on the PMC for Cassandra. And for the last year, I was the PMC chair for Cassandra. That's all work and code, blah, 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 blah. A little bit about myself personally. I am an Australian, as you may have already guessed. Uh, I do surf. Um, I, I love surfing, and I miss that terribly. I married a wonderful Norwegian woman, and I now have a family in Norway. Um, we're actually what we South Africans call swallows. And we have a home in Australia and a home in Norway, and we, we migrate back and forth a little bit. Um, but I love Norway. I love Europe. I love the diversity. Um, that you get living in Europe is truly wonderful. So I feel very privileged uh, to be able to be on this side of the world. A little bit more about the company that I work for. Uh, Datastax. Uh, we run in the cloud, uh, not just the technologies, Cassandra and Pulsar and Cascada and a whole lot of other stuff. Um, and not just as a service, we run it in any cloud, in any region. Um, but we focus on providing you a elastic, scalable, serverless, modern data platform. This is not analytics, this is a data platform in your application or transactional stack. Uh, today, because we have vector search, uh, and we have streaming, uh, and we have uh, we've, we were already doing a lot of real-time ML. We've stepped quite seamlessly into the generative AI space. Uh, there's a saying that there is no AI without data, and our customers are typically sitting on massive amounts of data. And, and what we've found is that uh, using embeddings uh, and taking advantage of the vector search that we've got, they can reuse existing large language models, and transform their business. Okay, so the agenda uh, is broken down into five parts. I'm going to touch a little bit on distributed data. I'm going to go through ACID. I'm going to go through some use cases of why ACID is important for us. Uh, then I'm going to run through consensus protocols. And then I'm going to jump into a cord. Put your seatbelts on. This is going to go fast. I'm going to try and get through it the best I can. Okay, so first up, distributed data. For this, I'm going to start with the opening sentence of the Accord paper. Modern applications replicate and shard their state to achieve fault tolerance and scalable performance. This presents a coordination problem that modern databases address using leader-based techniques that entail trade-offs either a scalability bottleneck or weaker isolation. Now, when you come to scale uh, and the scaling of data, um, there's usually three reasons. Either you've got uh, so much data, 
It doesn't fit on a single machine. Um, or you've got the need for high availability. Um, and there we're talking not just like two servers or failover, just like absolutely never, ever a moment of downtime. And the third one is your read and write traffic throughput. Um, people think scale is just about data. That's not true. Uh, you need to look at who are the consumers of your data, and if the read or the write requirements on them are significant, then you need scale. And there's two ways that we deal with this, uh, sharding and partitioning. It's very common in application development to shard data at the application layer. And that's a very smart way to do it when your data domains naturally shard. That when you have an existing constraint in your system, you're taking advantage of that. Um, that falls apart when people try and uh, take that approach to data that doesn't naturally shard. And they, they start fighting, um, you know, uh, replicating uh, Postgres and MySQL servers, um, but then they can't actually join the data that some consumers need to do. So just jumping back into Cassandra or applying Cassandra to this. Uh, so Cassandra is prevalent in companies which are successful. Uh, I'm biased on that term. And what I mean by that term is at scale. Um, so, and the key characteristics are high availability, linear scalability, which for business means cost predictability, low latency, and globally distributed deployments. For example, people use uh, this as an application database when they have uh, super critical availability requirements. Um, you know, we see banks uh, with very, very small data sets, like, like 10 gigs or 50 gigs, um, but they're kind of like uh, uh, part of the core infrastructure to the bank around the world. And so they'll just have hundreds of Cassandra nodes around the world um, just to make sure, because if that goes down, everything goes down for them. And the other one is at scale. And here we're typically talking about data that's above a terabyte, particularly data that's above four terabyte. The NoSQL moniker comes from the Cassandra project, at least the modern use of that moniker. And the NoSQL moniker was not ever about a dislike or a throwing away of SQL. So we've come, it's kind of been hijacked. The NoSQL moniker originally was, okay, the RDMS databases are monoliths, and it's time in history for us to rewrite them into microservices. That's not a simple thing to do, and it's going to be a long journey. Databases are some of the most complicated things in our industry. And when we start that journey, we're going to have to be selective about what we can provide. And we knew that if you shard in the application layer, and you see this with different solutions out there, you're shooting your foot off in the long term. That providing the partitioning in the database was what gave us the longest future. Um, but we had to drop joins and constraints and these aspects. So that's how we started with NoSQL. Then Mongo came along. Mongo was like, hey, we've got a database with a different interface too. So we're NoSQL. Oh, that's not quite what we were talking about. <laughs> Thanks for hijacking that one. No offense to Mongo. It's fantastic for a lot of use cases. Um, but it's just there's a kind of mismatch about what that moniker was about in the beginning. And we see that today as well. Uh, you know, if you take the open source Stargate project and you layer it, on top of Cassandra, you get lots of different APIs. You get uh, the time series APIs, you get the, the REST, you get the GraphQL, you get the document, and Mongo's compatibility, and gRPC. And we're working on SQL. We're closing that down slowly. And that's part of what this talk is about. So the next slide is talking about scale and not just where we're going with the 
technology within a database, but where the industry is moving. So this is a pretty simple and clean systems design or architectural overview um, of how many systems would look today. And what I want to illustrate here is that while we like to say we don't need to scale the data or you know, we don't have that much data or we'll deal with that problem later on, um, a lot of people are kind of looking past the, the landscape, all of the consumers, and where we're going. And if you look at uh, what's happening here, you see that there are, there's a lot of mess. There's a lot of copying data around into different systems. You know, we put the data into the database layer, and, and this could be anything, it, you know, to take put Postgres there or whatever. And we say, okay, we've got to copy the data over to our data warehouse or analytics platform. Or we've got, you know, and then we work on it. And we've got to bring it back into ML. But, it, you know, it's not fast enough in Postgres. So now we've got to put it into a different system. Or we have um, a consumer in the stack somewhere that's that needs even lower latencies and is just going to hurt my primary database. So we throw it into a Redis cache. Again, no criticism of Reddish. The full Reddish stack is pretty amazing with what they have to offer. But the point here is that there is a lot of copying data around. And I'm not talking about event-driven design because event-driven design and streaming is a first-class citizen in any system where we're going today. And certainly in the analytics stack, we talk about ETL as being dead and analytics as being dead and you know, like in, in the data mesh world. That's not entirely correct. In the cloud-native world, you've got to separate compute from storage. And if you can separate compute from storage, you understand that analytics as a compute function ain't going anywhere. But as we start to solve the technical limitation of the data storage, we understand that analytics doesn't need the storage component. It could, in an ideal world, work directly on the data where it sits. So scale isn't just about data size. And as you move towards uh, this system, it solves a lot of other trade-offs as well. We see, you know, like the, the sharding data that we often see, uh, and complex systems design problems like, like shadow paging and sagas and, and all of this type of stuff. It simplifies the system overall. Okay, but saying that, Cassandra's not fantastic. Cassandra is still a very raw database. And a lot of people get burnt with Cassandra because they go from an RDMS system and they start using Cassandra and they just use it the wrong way. They use it the wrong way and they, understand, they misunderstand how it can fall over in different scenarios. People say it's, it is essentially an eventually consistent system today. People say, oh, but you've got this strong consistency model. You know, you can, you can, if you write to a majority of your data replicas and then you read from a majority of your data replicas, you will always get an overlap and so you'll always get consistency. Sure, we have consistency in a system that's always working and working well. That's not the real world. Uh, if a quorum right comes into the system and it times out, the client just gets a timeout error. And they have no idea, did some of the data actually write or didn't it? Um, and, so you, and, so, and then you kind of get this eventual consistent state. So you have to expect in failure modes, eventual consistency in Cassandra. And there's a whole lot of other edge cases here um, I don't want to go into, uh, um, but it shows that Previous Cassandra, we didn't have acid at all. Okay. And I was just talking about simple single requests. Let's take this to a much richer example, which is, I think, uh, it's, it's a simple example, but it's a very real example for most developers. Okay. You want to be able to do 
transactions against your database. And that is do atomically consistent with isolation rights to multiple petitions, if not multiple petitions on multiple tables. I'll leave that there for a bit. And I'm going to jump into Acid. Let's get wild. And yes, the original uh, uh, folk that came up with the term Acid uh, I think some of the 70s were having fun with you. Um, it was always a joke. Uh, okay, so, so what is Acid? Probably obvious to a lot of you. Uh, I'm going to rehash it anyway. Uh, atomicity. Um, that when you do a transaction, it either works or it doesn't. Consistency, uh, that everyone else that reads that data after that transaction gets the data. Isolation, that as a user, you can work against the system and you're guaranteed the feeling you're the only person working against the system. That's not entirely academic correct explanation, but it's my layman's best explanation. And durability. You never lose the data. Uh, there's an interesting point uh, I want to share, a side note on durability, is that um, you know, you know the, the, the RDMS folk, and, and they're good people, and, and, and RDMSs are amazing technologies. Um, so so, so I'm, I'm playing with them here. Uh, but they'll sometimes give us a hard time about durability, Cassandra. And they're like, oh, you know, you don't really have durability. Like, what are you talking about? And it's like, yeah, no, your, your rights, you, you don't f sync on your rights. You know, okay. The default configuration in Cassandra is that we f sync, I think, every 10 milliseconds. Um, you can go into paranoid and f sync on every write, but it, it, it hurts performance. So the default is 10 milliseconds. And it's like, well, hang on a second. You're saying we don't have durability because we don't f sync writes, but like to lose data, you not only need to have a hardware corruption, and you would lose up to 10 milliseconds of data, you would have to have parallel hardware corruptions uh, on hardware around the cluster within the same 10 milliseconds to lose data. If that's your definition of durability, I'm sorry, but all RDMS systems don't have durability because when the one system goes down, you're back to backups. So going back to the example, Transaction here. So simple transaction, uh, we want to do uh, a transfer of money between two people, take $100 from account one, put that $100 into account two. Atomicity. It is critical that both statements either work or they don't. Consistency. The accounts must always have a, a positive balance at all times. Isolation, other users must not see this transaction in progress. And durability, like I've explained, we don't lose the data. So, getting a bit deeper. Uh, ACID and the SQL standard has four different isolation levels. Yet most databases today, the RDMS systems, they only do snapshot isolation. That's not full isolation. Databases today do not do ACID. And that comes as a surprise to a lot of people. Um, because you know you work with something like Postgres, uh, you expect a kind of like a mature product that's been around for so many decades that have nailed this stuff and has always honoured these principles. Let's jump into a bit more. This is a graph of different isolation and consistency levels. It comes from the Jepson web page. Um, and on, on the left-hand side, we've got the Isolation levels which are concerned with uh, data structures on a single node, and on the right hand side, consistency levels and atomicity. So, on the 
on the right hand, on, on the left hand side, we've got serializability. And serializability is about having always ordered atomic uh, updates, but not necessarily real time consistent. So this is more about um, all of the objects in the system. So it is the, 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 the execution of a set of transactions is serial or ordered. That's isolation. Linearizability is about the atomic and real-time consistency. This has a notion of a point in time of that transaction. And this is more about one particular object and its uh, consistency. And so what this means, like, like before you get up to the top with uh, linearizability, like, like for example, snapshot isolation, that you can have uh, isolation in parts of the system, you know? And, and so this means that you, you aren't guaranteed overall ordering. You're open to network partitions or lack of availability because you're not getting that serializability. And typical problems that can affect in here are write skew and read-only read transaction anomalies. Now, the RDMS uh, people traditionally did, didn't think that serializability was a problem. And that changed for them when multi-core machines came along. Um, okay, so moving on. Going back to Cassandra, let's look at some examples where we need that, that transaction today. This is an example of lightweight transactions that we have in Cassandra today. And this is what people try to do today, and it doesn't work. The same example as before. Okay, let's select the amount from accounts for the, the first account. Uh, check if the value is greater than 100. So then we use our lightweight transaction where we have this, this CAS or uh, compare and set. Update accounts, uh, subtract 100 from the value uh, on their first account, so long as that value is more than 100. And then, once we've done that, go add 100 to the second user. The problem here is if stuff crashes uh, in between the second and third query, all of a sudden $100 has gone missing in the system. Short and sweet. How do we solve this in a distributed system? There are different consensus models out there. We have the leader-based consensus models and we have the leader-less consensus models. Paxos was kind of the first one out there in many ways and the lightweight transactions in Cassandra are built on Paxos because Cassandra is a leaderless system that has always been a, a, a fundamental characteristic of Cassandra. That we've always had to have a peer-to-peer -peer system for linear scalability um, and, 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 and for it to work globally. But it has lots of weaknesses and I'll jump into that. And then along came the leader-based consensus protocols. So you have Raft and you have Calvin. And you know them in technologies like etcd, Fauna, Foundation DB. In theory, and, and to implement, they're much simpler. And they're also faster. So that's kind of why the industry moved on to them. But there's real problems with those leader-based protocols. You see that if you, you've seen that if you've ever tried to set up a Kubernetes cluster across different continents or multi Kubernetes setup. SED does not play nice with you. Since then, we have seen other leaderless uh, protocols come along, and Accord is building on top of these. Let's jump into uh, more of the characteristics about the two different systems. So when you have a uh, leader-based system, and here we're referring to stable leaders because uh, 
the leader has to be running. If it doesn't, uh, you have got a lack of availability. That's what people don't realize. That yes, there's a fallover mechanism there, but when the fallover, fallover mechanism happens, the system is down. It may be for a short period of time, but it's still down. You also have poor latency when uh, you have clients from, from different regions trying to connect, uh, and the leader is, is, is remote. And scaling transactions is really hard. You'll see more about that in a second. What are the benefits? Like I said, uh, they have better performance. Um, not only do they have better performance, that, that when things fail, uh, performance is, is more predictable or stable over time. There's an irony in that statement there, because when the leader falls over, you don't have a system. So it's kind of, you could kind of say the latency is infinity, and that should pull out the statistics, but it doesn't. But when the system is up, performance is stable. Jumping into the leaderless systems, and starting with Paxis, but Paxis is kind of a group of, of different uh, protocols today. So here you have a request or a transaction, and it can pick up any leader, or any data replica can be the coordinator for that transaction. This involves multiple round trips. This is the traditional Paxis where uh, there's two round trips, the prepare phase and the accept phase. Cassandra, we call the accept phase the propose phase. In Cassandra, originally, the implementation of Paxis, it was four round trips because of that condition that we have in there. We actually have to do a read. So we have to do the prepare, and then we have to go do the read, and then we have to go do the accept, and then we can kind of uh, return to the client and, um, and commit. In Cassandra 4.1, we did optimize this, taking uh, kind of some advantage of fast path um, uh, Paxis, uh, and kind of taking advantage of, of, of what we could agree on in those round trips. And so it's come down to two round trips, which is significant improvement, Cassandra. But Wherever there's contention on transactions, wherever there's overlapping transactions in flight, this all falls apart. And this is where Paxis really falls apart. It, just, it, it will keep on trying under contention, um, even to the point of failing out transactions and you have to start them again. We don't consider that acceptable. We've had, uh, and going through the different consensus protocols, we've had uh, uh, progression. We have what's called epaxis, and that is where, uh, in that fast path, we can actually um, reduce the likelihood of contentions by calculating the dependencies between those transactions during uh, the initial round trip. So if you understand the dependencies between transactions, um, you can actually agree on the order. And so that means you don't have to send out another um, prepare round. This still has a really high conflict rate. Um, it, it solves the problem a little bit, but just not enough. Then we have the Caesar consensus protocol, which came along and said, okay, Let's also do timestamp ordering on the transaction. So, so we can see the dependencies, how they kind of, uh, the, the data overlaps. Um, and we'll also get timestamps. That's uh, better because um, once the, that initial run was done, we can kind of go, well, we can see the, the, the dependencies and we can see with the timestamps ordering um, and, and we can get the, transactions now in order and we don't need to do another round trip to check. The problem with this is uh, we now have an unbounded commit latency and 
uh, we still need to do three round trips and use cases. Tempo came after this. I think Tempo is actually from France, I'm not too sure. Um, at least uh, a number of French people from Tempo have been helping us uh, with Accord uh, and working with us to, to, to proof the theory and, and work out bugs. Um, so there's been a lot of collaboration happening here. And what Tempo did is it actually got rid of the dependency calculation and they work with timestamps only. Um, and they found that the, that was far more effective. But the problem here is that they don't have commutativity. Um, what we mean by that is, for example, when you have transactions which are only reads in the system, um, you know, the reads can be interchangeable. So if you had the dependency graph there, you'd be able to see that. But as soon as you throw that away, you can actually um, kind of go, uh, well, all these reads, um, we just can let them go through. There's actually no contention there. Uh, and so Tempo kind of reintroduces uh, that problem. So something, summarizing that up, the benefits for the leaderless approaches are no matter where you are in the world, you get the same latency. It is now possible to do strict ser serializability. And failures only impact that data replica, which is coordinating uh, the vote, and the dependencies, which are basically on the same replica nodes. The downsides to this are you have, um, you still have poor stability under failure. You still have this fast path that needs no, like, like, like half of the nodes up and running. Um, and and so as, as nodes start to fall over, uh, you're actually putting like more load on the rest of the system. And so this runs the risk of cascading failure in the worst case. In the worst case. Uh, and so it's kind of like, yeah, you can set up a cluster and it can run really fast, but uh, when everything is working, but you kind of you have to capacity plan it for for its its maximum failure rate to, to deal with the leaderless approach. Um, and even in the best case scenarios, when everything is working well and there are no contentions, it is still slower than the leader-based consensus protocols because. Picking those variable uh, coordinators involves extra round trips. That's where we are today. Can we do better? Can we improve on that situation? Yeah, we can. Um, so research has come out of Apple and uh, out of Michigan University, I think. Uh, I had that wrong. Um, has taken all of these consensus, leaderless consensus protocols and figured out how can we do something better? How can we get multi-partition, multi-table, leaderless, global strict serializability with one round trip using commodity clocks? Commodity clocks is an interesting one because the other system that does this is Spanner. But Spanner only does this because it has specialized hardware clocks. So clock skew is a problem in distributed computing. Um, and it's still, like even Spanner, it still does multiple round trips. So Spanner is both very expensive and very slow. Not acceptable uh, for Cassandra, not accept acceptable for the engineers at Apple really hit hard with this problem. This is a big problem internally for Apple, and that's why they're leading the charge on this work. Most importantly, I would say uh, the problem with Spanner is that it's not open source. Um, that goes straight to my heart. It's got to be open source. Um, okay, so moving forward. There are two problems 
a novel solutions in a chord that we're they're trying to solve and solving. The first problem is when we talk about that, that fast path, those fast path operations, um, you know, th th they need that three quarter majority um, acceptance. And, um, and that's, that's problematic. How do we reduce that? So, learning from flexible Paxis, we're going to use something called fast path electorates. And the fast path electorates are by deterministically excluding nodes from that fast path round, we can actually reduce the number of nodes. So if everybody in the cluster, because it's deterministic, knows that two nodes do not need to be included, the total number of nodes uh, reduces, and if the total number of nodes reduces, the electorate, which is a quorum of those remaining nodes, or three quarters, uh, reduces. And you can see that we can take this all the way up to a quorum of nodes. So we can exclude up to almost half of the nodes in the cluster and say this is just our electorate. Um, and so long as we have that, that majority within the electorate, we have a single round trip. If it doesn't work, it just falls back to the slow path, or, or not the fast path, uh, Paxis, which is another round trip, um, but we still have strict serializability. So, so no problem there, but a significant optimization. A little bit of theory thrown at you. Um, this is how the different protocols work, uh, what their fast path or the electorate sciences are, and then how failure works. The important variable here is the F. The F talks about the number of extra nodes that you add to the electorate to deal with down nodes in the system. If I go back, if I went all the way down to the quorum and one of these nodes went down, the fast path just won't work anymore. So what we do is we add one node, or maybe two nodes, the F variable, to that electorate to account for down nodes in the system. And what we mean by robustness here is the durability of the data. And what we mean by stability here is uh, down nodes don't cause additional uh, network round trips or, or don't break the fast path. The other novel idea that we've got in Accord um, is timestamp reordering or the reorder buffer. Um, and this is building on Caesar and Tempo. Um, but it's looking at that, the, you know, in a cluster we know, uh, and using a timestamp protocol, we know the distances, the latency distances between nodes. Um, and we also keep up to date with the clock skew between nodes. So working with the skew and the, the max la the latency um, deltas, uh, we can solve problems like, like you know, say, say for example, the two bottom nodes center transaction, or the, the left bottom node center transaction first, and then five milliseconds, uh, the right bottom node center transactions they're going to come out of order, and that causes a problem in a second round network trip. And we can solve that problem by delaying that initial transaction, and that's that reorder buffer. So we say, look, we know that there's a latency gap here uh, uh, in T0 uh, edge um, or clock skew, and so we're just going to add um, those 15 milliseconds. Sorry. I made a mistake there. I am valuable. Excuse me. To the second node, we add the timestamp. So when the t second transaction comes in, we know 
like you're on a faster path, latency-wise, to the star replica. Um, at those uh, 15 milliseconds, so you're always uh, going to land in order. Now, the beauty about this is, you know, because you may think, well, how are you calculating that latency gap? Because uh, it's not just the speed of light. There's all these systems involved, and, and clock screw changes all the time. And, uh, the beautiful thing about this is, if it fails, like this is just optimization. If it fails, we just go back to how things normally work. Okay, so now I go into the theory of this. Um, I've only got a couple of slides left. I know this is a bit heavy uh, for everyone. If you go to the the CP page for Cassandra. We have CP15 for Accord. There, there's a thorough write-up on the proposal and the work. And attached to that page is a PDF. The PDF is the research paper. Um, and it has all the proofs in here. If you go to openlife.cc, there is a human readable version of all these proofs for those that don't like Greek letters. Um, but the proofs kind of break down into three separate phases. There's, there's the consensus protocol itself, the first algorithm, three separate algorithms. The second algorithm is the execution phase. It's not that interesting. It's pretty straightforward. Um, and the third algorithm is the recovery. Now, the recovery uh, algorithm is probably the most interesting and complicated. Like, when we get failures in the system, how do we continue? One of the interesting things about Accord is that we don't need to worry about rollbacks. If the transaction is accepted into the system, it will always succeed. So we don't have to implement rollbacks. That's a pretty fundamental aspect. Now, of course, the system can go down, the system or can get overwhelmed, and is, but then it won't accept it. Just says, like, I'm just not accepting it at the moment. This system is down. But if it accepts it, it will always land. So there was never a rollback. That simplifies a lot of the uh, atomicity uh, and consistency. So here, if you go through the proof, you can see that by agreeing on timestamps, um, you know, on the initial ballot, you know, uh, we can reorder those timestamps like uh, like Tempo does, and and get transaction through with that. This is essentially a durable lamp clock solution. Time is running out. I'm just going to jump over this slide. You can jump in to more detail. Um, this is a unique recovery mechanism approach, as well. Um, to summarize it, it kind of like unwinds uh, a, a number of the, the steps it does in the original consensus protocol um, until it can come back to a new uh, agreement and, and proceed. So, summarizing it up, we can get optimal fault tolerance and stability. Uh, we can get optimal latency under realistic conditions. Um, you know, the, the clock skew is bouncing around all over the place, except we're always strict serializable, and we have the commutability. This is really important for us, because if you have a Cassandra system and 90% of the transactions are reads, we don't want them to go slow. And, and so what we see with a single round trip globally, strict serializable approach, is that in a lot of systems, which, especially which are read heavy, um, we're not going to get the performance hit that you would expect from using such a consensus protocol. If you want a little bit more of a flashy business slide, uh, this is it. Uh, we're offering horizontal scalability, which are optimized for geographically distributed clusters uh, with the best in class performance. A shout out goes to the authors of this work, that is Benedict from Cassandra uh, and 
Tony, Heidi, Alex, and Blake and Scott, the last two names are also from the Cassandra project. The others are outside researchers. What is the state of this in Cassandra? Uh, I mean, this has been going on for a number of years now. Uh, we are implementing the consensus protocol in a separate code base. The idea there is that it's not part of Cassandra. It is a consensus protocol that anybody can go off and use. Today, we're pulling it into a feature branch. We expect it to land in trunk around September. Um, the current progress is that we're doing like the correctness testing. So very large scale soak uh, and fuzz testing to iron out every possible edge case at one of the biggest deployments in the world. Apple, Apple has, I think, getting up to 300,000 Cassandra nodes today. Um, yes. So that's me. Thank you very much. Uh, if you do me a favor, go check out Astra at datastacks.com. Um, it's your, uh, you, can, you can sign up and use it for free. It works in any cloud, anywhere in the world. It does vector search, it does streaming, it does AI, ML. It is your modern data platform. Uh, a little tip. If you go into the Astra console, it has a little intercom chat box in the bottom right. And if uh, that's a GDP uh, enabled chat uh, with embeddings. So you can kind of ask questions in there, you know, build me an app on Astra that does a to do list and, and it will generate the code for you. The really beautiful thing about there is that we're dog fooding our own vector search. And if you add to the end of the prompt debug in square brackets, it will give you all the tracing to how we look up our feature store, how we do the embeddings and the vector search, and then send it to the large language model and give you that answer. Um, so actually you want to see an application working in real life, being dog-fooded, uh, check it out. It's free. Um, even if it's just a reference, uh, go enjoy it. And if you've got any questions and you can ask them now, uh, or they pop up for you uh, tomorrow or a later date, just reach out and ask me, please. Thank you.